morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our participants from Los Angeles, Montreal, Hamburg, Geneva, and Lebanon. Those of you who have not recently visited Lebanon will find it difficult to recognize the country. A combination of crises has impacted it greatly. The October Revolution, the financial crisis, and COVID-19 had led the country into a dramatic deterioration in its social and economic climate. Unemployment, uncertainty, poverty, and hunger affect a large percentage of the population transversely. Famine and depression lie in wait. To cope with the situation, civil society and the Lebanese diaspora are working hand in hand to address this humanitarian crisis. A host of NGOs and associations are striving to make up for the failed state's inability to meet the basic fundamental needs of its people. One of these NGOs, the Lebanese Food Bank, has been leading the fight against hunger since 2012. My name is Antoine Caldani. I'm the president of the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars, and this is our seventh Rotarex session. This evening, we'll host Mr. Walid Malouf, the board secretary of the Lebanese Food Bank, who will shed light on the different activities of the association, as well as the enormous challenges they face. The collaboration between the Rotary and the Lebanese Food Bank is not a recent one. In fact, two of the association board members are Rotarians, past president Mona Canaan and past president Roni Farra the moderator of this session. In a matter of months only, Rotary contribution have reached 5,000 families, namely 20,000 people. We would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our local, regional, and international donors who believed in our plight and to tell them that the needs are ever growing. Continuity must be assured. We would also like to thank all our individual donors for their trust. Every dollar counts. Before welcoming our guests this evening, let's have an overview of our next webinar with Agop Dandiguian, our incoming president. Agop, all yours. Uh, thank you, President. So on the 10th of June, in collaboration with the Belgium Embassy, uh, we're welcoming a very interesting guest. His name is Jean-Pascal Maniferste. He's a Belgian academist, climatologist. At the age of 10, he built his first telescope uh, from scrap glasses he got from opticians in Belgium, in Brussels. He was the vice president of the IPCC in 2007 when the institution received the Nobel Prize. He's going to enlighten us about the climate change after COVID-19, and I'm really looking forward uh, the other guests that I'm looking also forward to, be, to, to meet and with all of us will be, will be visiting us on June 17th. Her name is Anna Lariu. She's a mindfulness instructor for the workplace and a mindfulness meditation teacher. She will be talking about well-being, that is a challenge under normal circumstances, uh, mental, and uh, when you add pandemic to the mix, our stress level and anxiety levels will peak. So mental, emotional, and physical inner storm will arise, no matter how chill we think we are. She's gonna enlighten us on understanding exactly what's happening in this emotional intelligence and will give us some hints I'm sure most of us need. Now, if you allow me before passing the microphone to Roni, who will introduce us to today's guest, I'm curious to have your opinion about something. What do you think is, uh, in your opinion, the volume of money we need to be able to assess uh, fully the needy population in Lebanon during this crisis. I'm going to launch a poll now, and you have 30 seconds to answer. TikTok, time is ticking. Ten seconds to go for your answers. We'll be sharing the results at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. 
Now, Roni, for those who don't know him, he's a Rotanian past president. He's the president elect of our club for the year 21 22. He is an icon of the Rotary World in Lebanon. He is the president of the Board of Trustees at the NDU. He is vice president of Lebanese Food Bank. Uh, he is our joker. And uh, some people even call him Sean Connery. Uh, Walid, the floor is yours. Uh, Roni, sorry, the floor is yours. Ladies and gents, dear friends of the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars, thank you for your presence with us tonight. <clears throat> Let me start with a quick word about the technical side. As you can see on your screen, you can use the chat window to express or share ideas with other attendees. The Q&A session will take place at the end of the lecture and you can ask your question in the Q&A window, not in the chat window, please. If you find a question particularly interesting, please use the little thumb and like it this will allow the question to go up in the list. This will allow us to ask the most relevant questions. Please note that all questions are allowed as long as they are topic related, of course. <clears throat> it does not, it does need to have a link with the present, does not need to have a link with the presentation of today. For your information, a short survey will be organized at the end of the lecture. It's a poll and it's a pop-up window, not in the Q&A window. You can apply on your screen. The results will be announced at the end of the Q&A session. Enough technical details. Let us focus on tonight's session. Our lecturer tonight is Mr. Walid Malouf. For the past two decades, Walid has been evolving globally at the intersection of urban development, destination creation, and lifestyle hospitality. He is currently the president of Blue Ocean Capital, a firm active in urban development, luxury hotels, and food and beverage. The firm partners with hospitality and real estate investors and developers globally as to develop innovative yet eco-responsible type projects in the USA, France, and Latin America. Well, it had previously led hospitality at CDCI, a global family office, where he worked on a multi-billion waterfront development project in Montenegro, Eastern Europe. He was also general manager and board member of hospitality development company, owners of the Pearl Qatar, partnering with numerous global restaurant brands, such as Megu in New York City, Say Young and Lisa in Paris, and lifestyle hotels such as Nikki Beach Hotels. Walid co founded Synergy Hospitality in 1999, a pioneering hospitality concept creator, operator, and advisory firm which grew from three partners to 800 associates under management in seven years, covering MENA. In Lebanon, Synergy was behind projects such as Circus. La Posta, Oceana, Bamboo Bay, and It Descends, to name a few. <clears throat> he spent five years in management consulting with Arthur D. Little and with Arthur Anderson, based in London and covering Europe. Walid is a fellow of the Aspen Institute's Middle East Leadership Initiative and of the Aspen Institute's Global Leadership Network, a DC based think tank working to move young and recognized leaders from success to significance. He is the board secretary and the chair of fundraising and expansion at the Lebanese Food Bank, <clears throat> an NGO aiming to eradicate hunger in the country through saving tons of food going to waste. Walid, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Roni. Um, well, if you, if, thank you so much. I mean, uh, you, you, you've said it all uh, when, when, it, when it was a bit too long, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, Roni, just for me to say it uh, to all of you around the world is, uh, is an inspiration to all of us in Lebanon working in, uh, in charity and in, 
social enterprise. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, introduction. I'd like to thank uh, the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars for organizing this uh, webinar. This is an honor, an honor for us to be uh, presenting our mission, what we've been working on for uh, eight years now at the Lebanese Food Bank. As Antoine Caldani, the president of the Rotary just mentioned, Lebanon has been going through unprecedented turmoil. I'm sure all, around, all of you around the world um, know that, uh, feel that, maybe through your connection, your family, your friends, but the third, uh, the third sector or the NGO sector in Lebanon is under tremendous pressure and we live it every day. My objective tonight is really twofold. The first is to uh, give, for those who don't know the Lebanese Food Bank, give you more insights on our mission and our programs, what we do and, and why we do it. The second really uh, objective is to share with you what we've been doing as a reaction to uh, the crisis, the, uh, the aggregate crisis that we've been going through one after the other. It's been a hell of a roller coaster and it's not over. We're just, it seems to all of us that we're just starting. So um, we're, I'm gonna go through those two objectives at the end, as everyone said, we'll have the chance to answer your, your questions. Uh, thank you very much again for taking the time and let's start. So we're going to talk about uh, our mission, which is since 2012, fighting for a hunger-free and a dignity-restored Lebanon. We want dignity to be back into the discourse of the Lebanese. Let me talk first about food waste quickly and globally. Globally, food, food waste is really uh, a, a, a staggering issue. It's not a Lebanon problem. It's basically a global issue. We throw away one third of everything we produce, everything we uh, plant. Uh, it's unbelievable. And, and that means 1.3 billion tons of food annually that goes to landfills uh, and that goes to, to waste. That means that we could feed uh, 1.5 billion undernourished people if we didn't have to throw, if we didn't throw that food. So um, beyond being a humanitarian issue, clearly this is a huge environmental and climate issue. Uh, and people don't think about it often as such. Let's talk a little bit about food waste in the MENA region, which is our region, the Middle East and North Africa. We import, as you may know, um, around 50% of our food needs. Yet we lose up to a third of the food we produce and or import. Uh, in this chart, you can see that fruits and vegetables are really uh, the ones we, we, the, the, we waste the most. We waste 50% of our fruits and vegetables. We waste 27% of our fish and seafood product. Unbelievable. We also we waste cereals and meats to a, a quite a, an important degree. However, in Lebanon, this is what it looks like. I mean, in, 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 in countries where food waste is treated uh, properly, that still is a problem, but not such a big problem. Here, around 85% of the waste we are uh, basically generating, the organic, the food waste, is dumped in landfill or in nature. Now, this produces a gas, which is the methane gas, that is 21 times more powerful and toxic than CO2. So people talk about, you know, pollution from cars. This is a much, much more toxic uh, situation, except you don't see it um, firsthand. Let's jump into the situation with poverty in Lebanon. Quite a subject, actually. As you know, statistics in this country um, are, are, are not so uh, common and, and they don't come easy and, and they're very questionable. So what, we, what you see on the screen in everything that we can find uh, either funded by the European Union or generated by international agencies. Poverty, as you see, has two layers. It, you've got people in extreme poverty uh, and you've got the upper poverty line. The poverty line divides poverty into two parts. So in 2005, 
you know, Lebanon was believed to have 29%, roughly 28.6, 29% of its population be below the poverty line. This means, this means for extremely poor people that they have to live with around $2.4 per person and per day uh, in a household. That's $2.4 per person and per day in one household. Uh, fast forward a few years uh, and, and Syrian crisis starts in 2011. In 2016, uh, a few years after the, uh, the Syrian uh, crisis started, this number was around seven, 37 and a half. We don't put it on this chart, but, but, but we have statistics that show 2016. Jump to 2018, there was a study funded by the European Union that brings poverty to 44%. Nowadays, nowadays, I'm sure you've heard on TVs and in numerous uh, newspaper art articles uh, that poverty in Lebanon has crossed the 50% of the total population. This is uh, insane. This is very scary. Uh, and, but this is very real. And what you see is that the extremely poor more than doubled uh, and, and, uh, and the situation is pretty dire. This is a, a map in the same study that was funded by the European Union in uh, 2018 and 19. Uh, this is, by the way, 2018. This does not take into account what has, happen what has happened over the, over the past few months, right? So this does not take into account uh, things happening uh, since the October uh, revolution, the COVID. This is just 2018. And you can see that overall Lebanon is roughly around 44%. And you can see the various governance. Uh, none, of, none of them, even the small numbers you see here, 36, 35%, is still very high by any standard. So let's talk about the Lebanese Food Bank a bit. It was established in 2012 by founder and president Kamal Senno uh, and a group of uh, board members, colleagues, who, uh, with very clear goals, uh, with very clear vision and mission, and I'm going to take you through those goals and, 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 and vision. The vision is pretty clear. It's a hunger-free Lebanon. We don't, want, and, and we don't want to see any people hungry in this country. It's not a very big country. Um, and and the, the, the terrible thing, it looks like a very utopian, a very uh, dreamlike situation. It's not true. Uh, if any country can, ha can do that, it's Lebanon, because we, 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 uh, we throw a lot of food, number one. Uh, and number two, the math add up. Uh, uh, you look at what we throw and you look at poverty and it, it, we, can, we can reach it if we have uh, an action to scale and if we have responsible people at various places uh, in both uh, public and private sector. So that's our vision. We, we don't want to see uh, uh, people hungry in this country. Um, the goals, as you see them, are uh, hunger eradication, but also sustainable invo uh, environment and livelihood Im improvement. And we'll talk about that towards the end of this discussion. Our mission is to alleviate hunger and help the environment through collecting uh, food waste of good edible quality and impartially distributing it to people in need as a means to social progress. Our values are one of transparency, are ones of sustainable engagement, but also are non-confessional, non-political, Lebanon and human dignity centric. This is what we believe in. What I'd like to introduce you to here a bit less serious a bit less corporate is is our team basically we can talk a lot but the faces you see here on this uh, on this uh, on the screen are the people who are making it happen so i'd just like to take this opportunity here to raise my hat to this team each and every one of us make the difference it makes a difference in the lives of you know thousands of people so i raise my hat to soha our executive manager i raise my hat to patsy to janine to mahdi to Rita, to, to every single one of you, you make us very, very proud. Not only they're amazing, but they're very, very well trained. Yeah, they're, good. they're very well trained guys. Every, every few months, they have to undertake another uh, food safety management um, uh, course uh, led by Boyker, which is a UK accredited um, uh, agency here in Lebanon, uh, on what to, uh, how to handle food, you know, what to touch, how to touch it, etc. So let's now talk, if you don't mind, about our areas. What, what do we do? What is a food bank? So we've got a number of programs. We've got a catering waste program, a money program, an education program. 
We've got a cooking program and we're working in lobbying through the Lebanese Food Coalition. I'll take you through them. Let's talk about uh, the catering waste program. Catering waste program is basically collecting uh, selected food going to waste, still edible, from donors uh, following safety and hygiene standards. We sign an agreement with a donor, whether it's a caterer, a hotel, you know, a restaurant, that remove their liability from the moment, from the moment the food leaves their premises. There is no longer liability on them. The Lebanese food bank takes the liability. This is what happens in a typical year. You can see here uh, a minivan, refrigerated van with one of our team members. Um, you know, every summer, it's, the, the catering really happens mainly in summer. We collect around food from around 100 events, some weddings, some other um, events. And this food collected from those weddings and events generated on average around 64,000 meals uh, that are distributed immediately uh, the same evening, actually, to uh, our, the network of NGOs we work with uh, late at night, so they, are, so they are consumed within one or two days at the most. This is a sample of our partner donors. You can see here, um, you know, prominent names in catering, like, uh, like Cat and Mouse, Nicola Aude. You can see prominent hotels like the Four Seasons, uh, and the Phoenicia, um, you know, and we had to gain their trust. It didn't, it didn't happen fast. They needed to understand that we are truly following international standards when it comes to, uh, when it comes to food handling, uh, venues, but also restaurants with one of our earliest adopters and, and fan, which is Lisa, both in Paris and in Beirut, Taule, Canel, and many others. The screen is way too small for for me to fit them all, but I'd like to just thank, uh, you know, a few. Sorry. I, and after that uh, 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 situation with the, with the catering waste, just a little note I forgot to mention before jumping to, 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 to the education program is in these restaurants, we, we only take the food when there are functions. So there are when there are parties and a buffet, we are not able to touch any food that comes on people's plates for obvious health and safety re uh, reasons, we will be tackling that food, hopefully in the future, through processing and other means. Let me now jump to our uh, education program. Our education program is basically about raising children and young adults' awareness about issues related to waste, issues related to poverty, uh, human dignity, uh, and making them understand, uh, you know, what it means to throw food. What you see here on the screen is basically uh, um, a few logos of the schools and universities we've had our school education program with. So what happens during this education program is our team at the LFB basically goes and gives a lectures to the elder student about food waste, about um, poverty, and then asks the class to pick two people in the classroom for them to become the institutors, for them to become the, 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 the coaches and make the same uh, lecture to, younger, uh, to the younger class. And by doing that under our supervision, the whole school goes through that awareness campaign, but in the, you know, uh, using the mouth of the children themselves. So what happens when you inspire kids is unbelievable. What happens is just spontaneous help. When you put children and young adults in, in, in the face of misery and poverty, they just don't accept it. Simple. They, it's not acceptable. So they come back to their family um, and, and, and they have numerous ideas to react. We've seen unbelievable initiatives like house renovations, not in our mission, but very happy to do so. Paying school tuition fees, paying house rental fees, paying medicine fees, buying missing equipment. And I want you to see it really quickly in pictures because it's heartwarming. This is a, a group of, uh, of, of, of kids who donated clothes and, and heaters for families in Einer Mene. This is another couple of children who decided that this lady needs um, someone to pay her medicine fee. These are kids who decided that 
this uh, family needs a new house and decided to fundraise on their own and, and, and basically uh, renovate the house with their own hands. And this is the ACS, the American Community School students um, who decided to cook food for the elderly and actually sit and eat with them, not just you know, cook the food. So this is all how inspiring the children can be and it gives us strength really and it humbles us every day to do more and to fight for our causes. Up to the next program now, the home cooking program. This is uh, recently we felt that people need love. <laughs> it's, it's a recent uh, discovery, people need love and love is cooked food, is not receiving uh, uh, money, it's receiving cooked food. Of course, the money helps, but it's just the, just the point that, you know, warm, warm, homey food makes a big difference. I'm not going to talk about the program. I'm, go I'm going to let this wonderful lady uh, talk about it for a minute. Oh, وطلع قدامي بوست لليبانيز فود بانك اتصلت فيهم وخبروني انه اذا بحب ساعد بقدر مرة بالشهر اعمل اكل بكفي لعدد من المحتاجين وهن ليبانيز فود بانك بيجوا بيدبوا الاكل وبيخدوهم لهالناس بشحنات مبردة جربت اول مرة او لقيت عملية كتير سهلة ما كلفتني كتير وعلقت بهالتجربة حتى اني رحت معه بزيارات ميدانية وصرت انطر من شهر لشهر لساهم بطفخة من قلبي بحضرها كل اول شهر وبلا ما حس صرت عم ساهم بقطعام 25 شخص من بيتي لبيته من مطبخي لصحنه عم نتشارك اللقمة وحتى لو مش على نفس الطاولة Yeah, so, so this is basically in a nutshell the, the beauty of the cooking program until now we had a around 85 ladies and gentlemen who opened their kitchen, opened their hearts to provide homey meals to the less fortunate. So next, next is our uh, MUNE program. Let's talk a bit about that. The MUNE program was basically thought as a means to reach out to, um, to regions in Lebanon where we were not really comfortable sending cooked food and repurposed food for health and safety reasons. You know, um, cooked food doesn't travel very well. So when it comes to areas like Tripoli, like Baalbek, like the south of Lebanon, we, a few years ago, we decided that we need to help um, in a different way. So we created that Mune box based on uh, many global initiatives um, that come as food relief for families that, you know, the food box includes um, typical items like uh, lentil, chickpeas, flour, burgol, uh, tomato paste, etc. Those are not by any means meant to fulfill 100% of the needs of, these, uh, of the people. Who, this is, uh, as most food relief programs, uh, those are there to support up to 30% of their calorific intake, you, you know, uh, for, as a family. Um, they still have to buy bread, they still have to, you know, buy certain things but it does provide quite a lot of support. And we started doing that um, uh, on a sporadic basis um, a few years ago. Finally, talking about our um, work in terms of lobbying, in terms of government lobbying. And to do that, we decided that uh, it, would be, it would be much better to do it as a, as a group, uh, to, to, to basically collaborate, to basically extend our hand to all of the uh, organizations in the third sector that have the same goal, the same aim. So this is how the Lebanese Food Coalition was created. Um, it was supported by the United Nations uh, Information Center, but also by the FAO. Um, we've co-founded it uh, with Act for Tomorrow, um, and we lead this coalition with a number of NGOs like Bonheur du Ciel, like Caritas, like Food Blessed, all doing phenomenal work on the ground, um, but it's an open it's an open member it's an open membership organization. It's open to all food related, you know, charity and, and uh, organizations. So, what does the Lebanese Food Coalition do? What why is it there? Ba basically, you know, uh, 
we're we're much stronger when we're united, right? So so what we're doing is one raising awareness on hunger and efforts um, to reduce it, pushing for efforts to reduce it. We're also uh, talking about the need to reduce food waste and protect our environment in this country. We've been lobbying for two years um, to change a law, an important law that relates to fast moving consumer goods um, uh, waste. So whenever you see food on the shelves of your supermarkets and you see an expiry date or a best before date, this food is not going to sell if, it's, if the date is very close. And currently, uh, and currently, the practice in Lebanon is horrific, it is terrible. Basically, for the importers to recuperate the VAT, because they've all paid VAT um, to get, to get um, this money in the country in the first place, they need to show uh, the government that this food has been destroyed. And it needs to happen on film. You know, it needs to be video or pictures. So because of that behavior, we, we, we basically destroy perfectly edible food. As we know, this date is not, is not uh, um, toxicity. It's about quality. It's a peak of quality. So we've been working on that and we really hope with, with the Act for Tomorrow and our friends at the, at, uh, at, uh, at the Food Coalition, and we're really hoping after two years of lobbying that we're now quite close to, um, quite close to a, um, a happy end to this, to this fight uh, uh, that we'll be announcing, I hope, very soon. So that's our work in, in, in lobbying. Let me tell you more about collaboration. Our DNA at the Lebanese Food Bank, you know, we don't function unless we collaborate. Our business model, if we can call it like that in corporate terms, our business model is collaboration. You know, all we are is a link. Uh, we're a link between people who throw food and people who need food. Very simple. So we've started with a small network, relatively small, a few years ago when we did start, uh, 30, 40 NGOs. Right now we moved just before the crisis to around 75 uh, NGOs that we support. We're now just above 100 beneficiary NGOs. So that's quite a scaling uh, in the last months, you know, from 75 to over 100. Um, that's, that's quite important. And, you know, the way people ask, you know, how do you choose? You know, Lebanon has thousands and thousands of NGOs. Some numbers talk about 8,000, 10,000 NGOs. You know, we're, we're 100. It's, it's, it's basically very, very um, simple. It's about how prof prof professional they are, how transparent they are. They need to, to, to submit documentation. Uh, there is zero discrimination on any uh, on any uh, um, subject apart from transparency, professional work, and ethical work. So this is uh, my hat off to all of you. Of course, they're not all there because I, then you don't see anything on the screen. So uh, these are just a few of the NGOs we, we, uh, we work hand in hand with. with. Um, similar to many thousands of food banks around the world, this has proven to be the most effective way to uh, reach people who are vulnerable. So my hat uh, down to all of you guys. So let's talk now uh, briefly about that famous, the, the crisis, that the famous situation that we are in. What were the trigger points? What triggered, or some of the things that triggered? Uh, again, uh, the page is not big enough. But I figured those were a few things. The first one is an escalating uh, situation due to decades uh, socio -political, of sociopolitical crisis in this country with endemic corruption. We re need, really never left the, uh, the war, the 75 war. We've been going from a crisis to a crisis uh, and it's been building up to a point of no return where we are today. Um, we shouldn't remember the Syrian, uh, the Syrian refugee crisis that hit us in 2011, and we're still one of the countries in the world that has the most refugees per capita globally. Uh, we were more recently hit by a currency devaluation with the dollar you know, moving from 1,500 Lebanese pound to 4,000 Lebanese pound. You can just think what this is doing to, um, uh, to all operations. I'm sure you know, but mainly to basic uh, basic foodstuff items. 
and our food box, you know, prices have have uh, have moved uh, dramatically. People now need down payment; they need cash. It's it's very complicated. We've got uh, capital control, as you know, being enacted by the banks. So that's another uh, major point that is uh, difficult for us to 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 deal with. We've got obviously COVID-19 pandemic in a country that has all the above, that's pretty tough. We've got exploding unemployment and I would rather not put numbers, but you know, it's hundreds of thousands. I'm sure you've heard uh, the hundreds of restaurants, the hundreds of companies that have either stopped paying salaries or had to let, let go of people. Um, in Lebanon, remember, it's a, it's, a, it's a dual effect of currency devaluation plus COVID. Uh, you know, that's not easy. Just to give you an idea, the CPI, which is, you know, consumer price index, uh, for the past 10 years have been increasing at 0.2% every month, by month. The CPI moves up 0.2%. You know, since October 2019, it's been increasing 5.5% per month. So that just gives you, <coughs> sorry, that just gives you an idea of what a crisis means in Lebanon today. Unlike other countries, you know, where, where the, the government is printing money or giving huge, huge packages, you know, Lebanon is exactly the opposite. It is really facing a dramatic, dramatic crisis. So, okay, so this is all very, very, uh, you know, dire, very difficult situation. How did we react? What did we do? So let me tell you now, uh, give you a few points about the, our crisis response. You know, how did we respond? And, I think some of the points you can see here are valid, whether you're an NGO, whether you're a small business, small and medium enterprise, um, they're valid for, for, for a lot of people. So what we did, uh, pretty simple, number one, is we prioritized health and safety. We thought, okay, we need to look at our team here and we, look, we need to look at our end beneficiary here. Uh, we don't want to put them at risk. And we're doing quite a lot of things in the area of food handling that can put quite a lot of people at risk. It wasn't an easy decision. Uh, it was discussed at the board level and eventually we agreed that number one should be the health and safety of both our teams, our team uh, that you've seen, you know, uh, pictures of uh, earlier and basically the beneficiaries. So we don't, you know, we, we want to feed people, we want to help them, but the idea is not to give them uh, uh, a virus or anything like that. So, so we've stopped uh, a, a number of programs that were uh, increasing the risk. Number two here is focusing on essential actions. You know, what is the essential action for the Lebanese Food Bank is recentering all our efforts on food relief, but on a much larger and national scale. That was the, the idea. So focus on the essential action is number two. Then you need to strengthen your relationship ecosystem. Everyone needs help. No one can work alone in vacuum. So this was our business model to basically work with others. But this was a time where we need to increase that and you know, duplicate that impact, whether it is other NGOs, whether it is volunteers. And here I'd like to, um, to thank the volunteer circle, an amazing initiative led by a very young woman, uh, who, who is doing fantastic work. The Volunteer Circle is an NGO that's mission is help other NGOs by, you know, training volunteers. Fantastic. And uh, we're very happy to be collaborating with, uh, with the Volunteer Circle. So strengthen the ecosystem. Uh, work with people across continents, but especially with the diaspora, the Lebanese diaspora. A uh, few um, of you are, are members of this diaspora. You're all over the world. This is giving us positive energy. This is helping us with resources. And it was the time to reach out. So number three. Number four is really scale up our essential resources. And this is why we decided with the help um, of our, of our uh, friends uh, to relocate from 200 square meter, uh, relocate our warehouse, our offices, our facility from 200 square meter to 1,250 square meters. Uh, warehousing. So this is going to really scale both our physical backbone and our human resources. And finally, the last point, which is not simple, easy to write, difficult to do, 
um, think beyond the crisis. So the crisis will end. That's, that's it. It's going to end eventually. So we need to envision ourselves after the crisis. So we continued working on our food coalition uh, agenda, changing the laws. We continued also working with an unbelievable um, partners uh, to invest in our long-term financial sustainability. We need to become sustainable and we'll be talking about that a bit, a bit later. So here it is. This is our response plan in five points. Um, now, let me show you a few, a few of those uh, theories in practice. So, so we need to, to work at scale. And so we were very open to uh, Beit al Baraka, one of the NGOs dear to our heart that we work with, when they approached us and basically mentioned uh, a, a possibility of a co collaboration on a very large scale with another NGO that's not unknown to uh, the Lebanese Food Bank, which is C. So here it is, partnership at best, uh, three NGOs uh, tackling one of the most pressing uh, challenge of the country um, on a national scale and in record time. So, you know, Beit al Baraka has been active in Lebanon since 2018, two years ago, and I'd like here to thank uh, Maya Brahimsha, the president and the founder of Beit al Baraka, that has immediately thought about us when it came to uh, tackling such huge challenges on the ground. And SEAL, SEAL is an, a, a, an NGO based in New York, for those of you who don't know, uh, established in 1997, helping throughout the years um, farmers and rural, uh, rural Lebanese people, giving them the capabilities to grow their business and to sustain their living. Uh, we've had a collaboration with SEAL uh, a couple of times before that major campaign. And uh, I'd like to thank here really uh, George Bitar and, and Norma Haddad for their trust in our organization. We're very proud to be joining hands with you and Beit al Baraka. So what, we, what did we say? What did we come up to do? We decided uh, to put a target for ourselves, which is to create relief for 50,000 vulnerable Lebanese families, distributing the food relief boxes all around those families. To give you an order of magnitude of what 50,000 number means of families, uh, remember that according to the stats or the numbers we have, we've got around 450,000 vulnerable families today that includes extremely poor and poor. But if you look at the extremely poor, you're talking about around 90,000 people, uh, sorry, families living in extreme poverty. That is around $2 per person and per day. So that gives you a little bit um, an idea of what, of what 50,000 uh, means. Recentering our effort um, on a national scale means communication and engaging uh, the energies, the positive energies of everybody. And here, I would like you to, to see, um, to watch another short video. <laughs> صرخت الوجع هاي سبب الظلم مثل مثل مليون ومئتين ألف لبناني اليوم عايش تحت خط الفقر عايش بأقل من سبعة ألف ليرة بالنهار إذا بقي ببيته ما في طعم عيلته بس حتى لو الظروف فرضت علينا نكون بعاد عن بعض نحن دايما قلوبنا عن بعض بيت البركة وبنك الغذائي اللبناني مع خمسة وتسعين جمعية بكل المناطق اللبنانية عم يعمل مستحيل لا يطلوا على كل بيت بلبنان ويأمنوا له أكل وشكلات خضرة بلدية تنزرع على البلكون أو على السطيحة لتمرق هالأزمة على خير هيدا مش أول أزمة تمرق علينا ونتخطاها سوا مش مسموح أي إنسان بلبنان يموتوا من الجوع ونحن بعدنا عايشين وقدرين نساعده اللبناني ما بينسى خيو اتكيلنا عليكم What I'd like to do here is really to, to, um, to, to thank uh, from, from the deepest of my heart, uh, Mr. Elif Fahed and our national star, Nadine Lebaki, for such a wonderful and beautiful and heartful endorsement of our cause. Thank you so much for producing this. Thank you, Maya, again, 
for joining forces with us. We're very proud. So going further, oops, sorry, a little technical error. I just want to jump to the next page. Okay. So what is this 50,000 again? So this is 50,000 food box. This is going to reach um, 175,000 to 200,000 beneficiaries um, in 351 regions. This is throughout Lebanon. Uh, and that's actually over 95 NGOs. Um, it's more like 100 now. Um, this is, so this is a challenge we set our, ourselves to do at the time of galloping currency devaluation, at the time of safety um, hazard with COVID, and at the time where mobility and transport in Lebanon is extremely hard. So how did we do that? We've prioritized areas of extreme poverty. We've been vetting the NGOs, as we said. We're trying to support the underdog, meaning not the, the NGOs, uh, trying to find the NGOs that are not getting the massive donations, you know, from countries or, 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 or other uh, forces on the ground. We're also um, planning to do post-operation evaluation and control mechanism with, um, with 3QA. 3QA is a UK, you know, accredited um, 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 company that, that is providing us coaching and, and help uh, with regards to enhancing our um, mon monitoring and, and, and control procedures. You know, we were not set to become, to become such a large uh, operation. A few pictures um, of the work that has been on the ground a month, barely a month after we decided we we're going to do it. Uh, we were very proud to see the uh, Lebanese armed forces supporting this initiative, believing in it. Um, and after an unbelievable fundraiser organized with SEAL, uh, where we touched the generosity of the Lebanese diaspora and the solidarity of it, we were on the ground. And we started with thousands and thousands of those boxes um, uh, basically, basically uh, uh, distributed. This is what it means. I'm now uh, getting close to the, to the end. I just want to share with you here some of the institutional supporters um, that have believed in our cause. We're very honored to count you as supporters, uh, whether it is Alfanar helping us in our sustainability, whether it's LIFE, the British Lebanese Association, the British Le uh, LIFE, uh, sorry, or the British Lebanese Association, whether um, it is George and Amal Clooney through uh, Baria Alameddin, you know, Amal Clooney's mom, or of course, SEAL, the Rotary, and, um, you know, the Jordanian Lebanese Association, the Fondation CMA, CMA, pardon, CGM. We're very, very proud uh, and we're humbled by your, um, by your support. Of course, thousands and thousands of unsung heroes, people who are avid fans, giving us money, giving us time, more importantly, we love you all. You know, there isn't enough webinars to thank you all, truly. Finally, before uh, giving the, the word back to, to Ronnie and, uh, and Antoine, I just want to talk to you briefly about the power of one. I'm getting a lot of, uh, a lot of queries from very close friends, you know, oh, the Lebanese Food Bank is getting a lot of donations. Uh, you know, should we help, you know, smaller NGOs, charity? You know, um, so I, I just want to speak about something that, uh, that makes me think. It's called the power of one. Power of one is that basically, you know, no matter, no matter, you know, where you are in the spectrum, helping is not a matter of, uh, of the size of the help. So I just want you to imagine that every Lebanese citizen around the world donated just $1 per month. $1, just $1, not more, every month. Um, basically, what this would do is it would, it would enable us to distribute one food box, which is really dignity. I mean, this is really not feeding the whole family. This is just giving them uh, basically a third of their calorie intake. We could, we could distribute one food box to each of the 450,000 vulnerable family. That's each, if, it, if every Lebanese, whether from Lebanese descent or from uh, Lebanese uh, nationality citizenship gives us just one dollar, that's it. And this is in terms of crisis. Um, but what's unbelievable is that we could do that every month. Every month, one dollar, we would feed everyone. 
So here it is. Um, I come to the um, end of this conversation, which is more like a monologue on Zoom, but uh, you know, I'm eager to answer your questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for connecting with us. Um, if you want to stay in touch, this is, these are our detail. Thank you very much. And it's now to you, Agop. Thanks a lot. Well, Walid, thank you for this amazing presentation. Indeed, people need love. Uh, love is cooked food. I really, this is an amazing one. And indeed, smallest efforts combined together are going to make the help that we need. Which brings me to posting the results of the poll. As you imagine, it's $15 million a month that we need in Lebanon in order to be able to assist fully the needy population currently in this crisis. So we really need everybody's help. Thank you again. And uh, Roni, all yours. Okay, I have uh, several questions. The first question, which uh, got the most uh, request, what are the post-COVID crisis sustainability plans for the Lebanese food bank? Okay, um, post-COVID sustainability plans, very interesting. So in reality, what we need to do now is to think about how to become a social enterprise. And this is where our work with Alfanar is important. Uh, we're looking at, and with a group of very talented and bright individuals, uh, young Lebanese in, in, Lebanon, in London, they call themselves Impact Lebanon, who've been helping us also amazing uh, the diaspora we want to invest in a business uh, uh, that is for profit so how can we use all the wasted food that i mentioned that cannot be eaten uh, because it was on a on a restaurant table how can we use that uh, very valuable uh, calorific very valuable um, uh, raw material to actually make money and there are many ideas some of them are related to composting some of them are related to um, animal feed but the idea is to invest in a business that would be um, under the Lebanese Food Bank eventually. We're exploring this. There was no decision yet made. This has to be discussed at the board level, but we're exploring. We need to look at it. We need to become sustainable, meaning we have to decrease our, um, our, our vulnerability to donations. We're looking at those plans, investing in a business that makes us some profits and then re-injecting 100% of those profits for helping human dignity in this country. Next question, maybe you answered partially. How could Lebanese Food Bank and similar initiatives help people sustain themselves rather than being at the mercy of donations? Yes, this is uh, kind of the third level. This is, the, this is our ultimate goal, right? So it's uh, teach someone how to fish instead of giving him a fish. Eventually, we will get there. We're still eight years old uh, as an organization. We will get to the point where our work will uh, lead people to reduce their, uh, their financial burden when it comes to food to allow them to gain a new, uh, gain a new uh, skill and, and then connect with other NGOs and tell them, you know, you're on the Lebanese Food Bank program for six months or for a year or two years. But during this time, you don't sit and relax. We would like you to go and work with this other NGO that's going to teach you a skill so you can slowly get out of the need for the Lebanese Food Bank. My next question, how can we help Lebanese Food Bank? What do you need? Do you need more funding? Do you need more donors? Do you need equipment? Do you need volunteers to distribute the food? It's pretty much all of the above, really. I mean, yes, we need funding. As you know, we're getting uh, the generosity is phenomenal, but we're, we're far from, uh, from the numbers we're talking about. So we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, tens of millions, uh, and we don't know how long this, this crisis is going to last. So yes, we're getting uh, generous donations, and we're very honored, frankly. But we do need fund. We also need... Uh, we also need uh, capacity building and we're, you know, we're blessed to work with organizations that are helping us improve our processes. We we're, already have been improving our processes, but, but uh, knowledge is important uh, and, and knowledge sharing is, is what we're all about in collaboration. Right. My next question, 
the central bank should be issuing in the coming few days a new circular that would subsidize a number of basic items like sugar, grains, and powdered milk. How would that help in the food box budget? Oh, that would help tremendously in the sense where, you know, um, our suppliers now are, our suppliers are uh, under loads of pressure. You know, the Lebanese Food Bank and Beit Baraka, as well as SEALS initiative, is, uh, is the, probably one of the largest, but there are many, many small initiatives. They're all equally good. They're all fantastic. But this is putting pressure on these, uh, on these food items. And, and by subsidizing them, at least, it, we're basically, in a nutshell, we'll be able to feed much more people with the same amount of money because prices are escalating sometimes a bit more than inflation or devaluation. Another interesting question. Do you have any data on the change of status of the middle class from the latest study done? No, I haven't seen data that is reliable yet. Um, the, the lady mentions a study. I don't know which one. Uh, I haven't seen it. We, we can, you know, we, beyond studies, we can see it, frankly. We can see it, from, you know, from all around us. But I don't have uh, data. I know that... Uh, all discussions with corporate leaders, with, with business owners, uh, what it feels like is that this, the middle class has been the most affected uh, this time, the most affected. People in poverty are e even more in poverty, they can afford less, but people who are making ends meet, who are the large majority of the Lebanese population, have either lost their job or are paid half their salary and in Lebanese pound. So, so now, uh, you know, someone who was making $30,000 which in Lebanon is a good salary, now makes $10,000, you know? So, so it's the majority and I don't have studies, but I can tell you, you if you live here, you, you really feel it. One, <clears throat> another question. How can the third sector or the NGO sector be more effective in addressing the crisis the country is facing? Yeah, good question. Basically, um, coordination and, and uh, basically working hand in hand in an organized way, in an organized way. Uh, there needs to be a higher authority or even just a group of us, uh, maybe uh, coordinating action on the ground. So, so we don't overlap. We don't do uh, twice the same, the same uh, action in one area and nothing in another area. So there, need, there is a need for the third sector to be coordinated uh, and to be sharing notes more often on a larger scale. Another question. Is food preparation still accepted or are you only focusing on food boxes? We're currently focusing on food boxes. Um, we, are, we will be talking soon in our upcoming board meeting on, uh, on whether we can take measures to um, uh, to change that policy immediately uh, and basically starting to, to, uh, to reactivate our cooking, uh, our uh, home cooking program. Um, but for the moment we're focusing because we need to focus, right? We, we, we have a very major uh, challenge and it's a national and huge effort. So we, we would rather focus, but we're, we're, we're discussing, you know, um, relaxing certain rules we, we put ourselves. Uh, can I add here, uh, between brackets, uh, during Ramadan, we served 18,500 persons a hot meal in Tripoli, in Saida, and in Beirut. Maybe it's good to know. Absolutely. Another question. Yeah. Absolutely. We did that through um, third-party kitchen, uh, who were very well controlled, and, and yes, and because we, we believe that, you know, warm food is, is important. Uh, another question. I would like to hear about the targeting of the 50,000 vulnerable families. How are they identified? Oh, this is a, a very, very difficult, very, very challenging, um, very challenging. We started with the NGOs that Beit El Baraka and Lebanese Food Bank have been working with and have vetted over the years, right? So we've been on the, on the, on the ground for eight years. Um, Beit El Baraka has been on the ground for a couple of years. We put our notes together um, and, and we start with that premise. We've also added some, some NGOs 
that have accepted to follow our, our guidelines and our stringent uh, quality control measures. Um, it's a matter of, so the answer is uh, statistics. We looked at the statistics of where extreme poverty is. We also looked at our knowledge of the ground to understand, you know, who is getting massive support and who is not getting any support. And those things happen just by being on the ground uh, and then apply common sense. Thank you, Walid. Uh, one interesting question. Uh, do you have 100% uh, Lebanese products in your boxes? Or all the box is made of 100% Lebanese made products? Very good question that leads on to a point I put to myself to discuss, but uh, you know, um, not 100%. In the, um, in, the, in the food box, and one of the uh, beautiful uh, uh, dimension of our work with SEAL is that SEAL supports the SEAL farmers. The SEAL farmers are uh, small farmers throughout Lebanon who have received support from SEAL and who have uh, a, a, to buy equipment to improve their processes. And the food boxes that we're now distributing have 50% of the components made by those Lebanese uh, farmers, so it's a virtual, it's a virtuous, sorry, circle. Um, um, this initiative is also helping um, the seal farmers um, uh, scale up and 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 go up in quality and go, go up in, in in scale. Very happy about that. Uh, hoping that in the future, 100% of our of our food boxes will be made in Lebanon. Uh, Ronnie, we've lost you. Ronnie, can you unmute yourself? Is, is the Lebanese Food Bank considering complementary initiatives to food distribution at the moment? For example, education leaflets included in the food boxes to inform and educate on safe food preparation, easy recipes, food conservation, essential fresh food for a balanced and nutrition diet. Fabulous question from Walid, my friend Walid, and thank you for asking it because it leads me on to another point, which is dear to to uh, Beit El Baraka and Maya and many people uh, now realizing how important food security is, how important it is to plant ourselves and, and eat, you know, real food, uh, real food, basically not full of uh, uh, fertilizers, etc. This initiative. Uh, the 50,000 food box seal Beit Baraka initiative, uh, we're distributing seeds also, seeds for people to plant, to encourage them to plant their balconies, to plant their um, backyards. Um, and we have a leaflet, <coughs> we have a leaflet, sorry, uh, that will go into probably into wave two, doing exactly that, educating them about, you know, health and safety. We've done that before in all our uh, food boxes distribution uh, educating them, uh, washing their hands, making sure that they're safe. So uh, thank you very much, Walid, for the question, but we're exactly on the same track. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, thank you, Walid, for this uh, overview of the activities of the Lebanese Food Bank. You have obviously a great team doing an exceptional work, a team that understands that the fight against hunger is above all a fight for the dignity of its fellow citizen in a failed state. A big thank you to our moderator this evening, the tireless uh, Roni Farrah, who has dedicated a life in service above self, a true motto of the Rotary. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants for joining us today. Thank you for your generosity. And most of all, thank you for your trust. In our incoming webinar, we will be talking about the impact of the pandemic on the climate change with one of the most preeminent speakers, Monsieur Jean Pascal van Ypersel. Until then, stay tuned and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.